Hello, today we're looking at a flanged mace. Uh, I'm going to pronounce it that way. I've heard it a couple different ways. I'll just go flan, like the dessert. And, uh, you know, it's an elegant weapon, which is funny because it's such a just brute basher of a fighting tool at the same time. The thing about this one in particular is that it is what is known in antiques circles as a Victorian copy, because it's a copy of an original made in the Victorian era. Now, by then, people weren't running around bashing each other in the head with these things anymore. Uh, come to think of it, I guess the equivalent of the Victorian era would have been saps, blackjacks, and kosh is uh, my specialty. But they were fascinated with uh, all things medieval and renaissance, and they did a great job of replicating weapons. So this is kind of a cool way to get a hold of one. This one's not mine, but if you want a historically accurate weapon that's still old, but not as old as an original would be, and therefore is expensive, then a Victorian copy can be a way to go. It's called a flanged mace because it's flanged. They're the flanges, right? Basically those plates kind of sticking out. And this serves a couple different purposes. For one thing, imagine if this striking hit here was solid metal, if it didn't have all that space in between those, uh, you know, those plates, essentially. It would be way too heavy to use in actual combat. It also gives you a reduced striking surface, which is always a good thing with weapons, you know, if you want to do maximum damage. But with this one in particular, that wouldn't be as big of a deal, right? Because it's kind of like a bed of nails. The force is still going to get spread out over a lot of them. Now, when you had a flanged mace that was just four or something like that, then much more of a difference. Also, as I've said before, you know, my theory is fashion is the least understood influence on weapons development throughout history, and these just look cool, don't they? Look at that. It looks kind of like a scepter, you know? They look great. Now, flanged maces have been around for a long, long time in a variety of cultures. The idea of, well, if I kind of chisel or carve or whatever down this striking surface, uh, you know, striking area, it's going to be better. That's You can see that in Mesoamerican stone maces. You can see that in much simpler looking versions of like this guy here from, say, like the Crusades. Nor was it restricted to the, say, Old World and New World, meaning Europe and America. Uh, this was a big thing in the Near East especially as well. It was just a great idea, so it got used in a lot of places. It's definitely got simplicity on its side, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Not, not necessarily aesthetically, but uh, functionally. So, just to show you a few more details, uh, here on the bottom there's a nice chunk taken out of that guard, which I thought was interesting. And that guard does serve a purpose. It's got some extra rings, if you will. They're not really rings. But the main one is going to help keep that thing from slipping out of your hand. It's a fairly heavy weapon. Not as heavy as you would think if you're not familiar with these things, but still heavy. You swing it, get a lot of momentum going, it's going to want to slip out of your hand. So it's kind of a retention system there. Notice about halfway up the shaft, there's a raised rib kind of ring. I mean, in theory, that would keep your hand from maybe sliding up it, or a blade from maybe sliding down onto your hand, but I think that's really just more decorative. Speaking of east of Europe, here's evidence of that, and notice the shape there. This is one you'll see kind of typically as well, where we are looking at kind of this pear shape. Here you've got the flanges that terminate in spikes, so you get even more of a reduced striking surface. And just to prove that the Victorians knew their stuff, here's a museum specimen. And you can see so this is the real deal, and you can see how remarkably similar it is to this one right here that we're looking at today. Now, maces in general, and this being one variety, all have really the same selling points, and they do have a lot of selling points because it's incredibly durable. You don't have an edge or a point that you have to maintain. You don't have to find gaps in your opponent's armor. You don't have to try to hit, you know, a vulnerable spot. This is going to hurt wherever you hit, and it's going to work against even the strongest armor, assuming you get a nice clean strike. And it's not just that. You know, swords can bend, they can break, they can dull. It also takes a high level of skill to create a good one. This is easier to produce and infinitely easier to maintain. And like I said at the start, despite how simple of a tool it is, a simple of a fighting tool, uh, it's also gorgeous. It has a great look to it. So they could uh, still give you something that you're kind of proud to walk around with, uh, even though it really is just a giant hammer. So as you can see, people were into uh, kind of HEMA and recreation of uh, earlier European fighting implements and techniques uh, long before today. So the Victorians were at it a long time ago. Thanks.